day the fish head. Given a choice, you might want to be one. They the fish head. Given a choice, you might want to be one. I mean, or at least a sociopath. Now it turns out there's a really easy way to do that. And millions of people around the world have already taken a bold step in that direction. The connection may not be clear at first, but it will reveal itself. I was at a funeral of my mother and a really beloved woman. And I have a relative passing around Valium. I said, what is this? They said, oh, uh, it's OK. It'll make you not be nervous or, or depressed. I said, I'm grieving. I want to be nervous. I want to be depressed. As my mother is dead. If, you know, what is the whole point? They said, well, no, but you, you, don't you want to just be calm? I said, no, you're missing the whole point. The point of, of the reason you're at a funeral is not only to show respect to the dead, but to grieve, you know, to, to indicate to yourself how much you miss this person. And they couldn't even understand that message because their whole orientation has been so undercut, so brainwashed, if you will, by, by the pharmaceutical messages Whatever, whenever there's a problem, there's a drug for it. It's a drug. Which uh, makes you feel happy. Antidepressants, sure, yes. Yes, I have heard of antidepressants. Yeah, I know what they are. But I don't know anybody. It's a medication. Yes, medication. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah? I honestly don't know. No. I heard about them. That sounds really That's familiar. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, uh, Prozac, no. Xanax, yes. Uh, Do you have any? A little more than 67 and a half million North Americans have taken a course of SSRI antidepressants, which is a phenomenal situation. I do not have any personal experience, now. None? I'm a very happy person. <laughs> Are you? No. I'm a happy person. No personal experience. Not personal. No personal knowledge. No. 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 Personally, no. But I know people who have had experience with those type of things. People have been demanding the medical industry make them feel better for centuries. The first drug, which was probably demand-driven, was um, probably drugs like Valium. If you take it under the, under the right circumstances and in the right dosages, you're going to feel better in, in the traditional sense. You know, you're going to get a buzz. Uh, and it was those drugs that really, I mean, before the antidepressants were the blockbuster drugs. Or drugs, huge numbers of these drugs were prescribed. Valium cut through to the masses. It's an anti-anxiety agent and a very effective anti-anxiety agent with a lot of side effects and it's very addictive. In the beginning, a little bit like Prozac, they thought that it didn't have many side effects. In 1987, when Prozac was approved for the market, uh, it was promoted very heavily, but it became a blockbuster drug, um, in large part because the media just set off a phenomenon, uh, the Prozac effect. Uh, it was on the cover of Newsweek in the early 90s. There was a very famous book called Listening to Prozac. Sales hit $1 billion, then $2 billion. A billion dollars in sales it represents what they call a blockbuster drug. Another critical moment that sort of brought it uh, to the level that it's at now uh, was the television marketing of drugs. 
Television ads for drugs were illegal in the United States until the late 90s. That brought Prozac and Paxil and Zoloft, Paxil and Zoloft into people's living rooms sort of on a nightly basis. Everybody with a sort of passing anxiety or depression or uh, seasonal affective disorder um, can be potentially medicated or potentially diagnosed. You know, sibling relational problem, which is, you know, duh, you know, having problems with your brother or sister. Uh, and to me, that's not psychiatry, that's not dealing with mental illness. The concentration on schizophrenia, on major depression, on bipolar disorder has been to a large degree diverted to the, the everyday anxieties, but we've diagnosed them and medicated them in extraordinary fashion. But I do know that the people that do take them, they work for them. If they don't take them, they go back crazy. That's just about all I know. Well, it's just a mess being on antidepressants. They create as many issues as they solve. Oh, my father is another one. My father was on Prozac for a while. One of the ways that, that Prozac became so popular and the way the drug was marketed was that um, it would allow you to function better and to be more effective in a, a competitive society and sort of mask, you know, attempt to master those fears. For mild depression or the appearance of mild depression and the medication of that condition, uh, the stigma is so far reduced that it's actually kind of cool you know, to be fucked up and messed up and stressed out and concomitantly to be. There is a consequence. These are serious drugs. And you see it on college campuses um, where so little of a big deal that it's almost dangerous. In addition to the recognized problem of uh, increased obsession with suicide, a litany of further side effects that actually when you when you compare those with the fact that people sometimes have been prescribed a drug because they're afraid of going to parties. The whole thing just becomes so, so surreal. How do you say, okay, I, I'm, I'm prepared to risk renal failure because I'm a little shy when I go to a party. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely absurd. I get it, I get it. People are taking these drugs which have a dubious effect and they're taking them when they don't really have anything wrong with them. Why do I care? The drugs that we take for depression now, the uh, SSRIs, largely work by uh, changing the metabolism of serotonin in the brain. One of the things that these drugs do seem to do pretty consistently when they're working is they, they sort of curtail or attenuate emotional life. So many people describe um, how they're in situations when they've been on the drugs for a while where they know they should be getting angry or they know they should be sad and they sort of are sad but they're not feeling what they would expect to feel. I've written about how the drugs generally for some people sort of numb them out you know and many people have written about how you know our normal affect which is mood will go up and down and many many people have written about how that that range becomes much more the, the highs get get topped off and the lows get bottomed out with with Prozac and, and similar drugs and I've seen you know definitely a um, a narrowing of that emotional range and a, an associated indifference to the larger world I think that it's possible to say that without that access without the access to those depths of feeling it's very difficult to develop empathy, empathy of the kind that really affects behavior. I mean, if you look at the, whatever we're going to call this time that we're living in right now. So what allows people to stand back and watch that happen? It's interesting to see this. And then if you add to that the fact that the particular nature of these bubbles is that it's all form and no content. It's all ambition. It's unbridled uh, speculation. And it's fueled by what? By confidence. If you go and you look at what people experience when they take these drugs, what they experience when they take these drugs is an upsurge in feelings of well-being, confidence, uh, resilience, the ability to sort of take what comes and not 
let it lay you low. And I think that it's possible to assemble a picture where it at least bears investigation what these two phenomena have to do with each other. The fact that um, so many people have, in, in, in the financial markets have been taking antidepressants is a cause for worry. When those people are not um, receiving enough feedback, gut level feedback on the consequences of their decision. Speaking personally, because I've taken the drugs, um, fear seemed farther away. It seemed like coming from a different place. What I described is something that bothered me before the drugs, before Prozac, uh, that felt like a steak knife if it was on my cheek, felt like a butter knife. And so the sharper things in the world went from steak knives to butter knives. The issue of emotional blunting that is widely known to be a side effect from SSRI antidepressants becomes very worrying in those contexts because those people need to feel a certain amount of feedback, as it were, perceptually with their actions. It's one thing to know it cognitively, in theory. It's another to feel it viscerally. Action. Is it wise? Is it cautious? Have I correctly interpreted everything? And the body, the, the, the mind, needs that kind of feedback. You know, if you think about simple things that are supposed to underlie Western civilization, the categorical imperative, uh, the golden rule, these ideas that somehow because of your regard for other people, you must behave in a certain way, even if it's not a law, even if nobody told you to, but simply because you can resonate with that other person. Uh, I think we need access to our full range of emotional experience in order to do that. Okay, let's go back to the beginning. It's tempting to want to stop here and say that the problem the ultimate fish head is psychopaths and people taking happy pills to deal with psychopathic conditions. But that's sidestepping the main issue, which is why are we, the rest of us, not doing anything about it? So what's the connection between psychopaths and happy pills? Empathy. Simple human empathy, or the lack of it. Psychopaths don't have it, and happy pills kill it. Sorry. So the, f the famous research by my colleague Stanley Milgram shows that at least two-thirds of all people, of all ordinary citizens, when told by somebody who seems like an authority, to physically punish someone else, they blindly obey. So going back to the famous study by Stanley Milgram in which he gets a thousand ordinary citizens from two towns in, in Connecticut to believe that they are teachers trying to help a learner learn by punishing errors, but the learner who is actually a confederate of the experiment and the teacher doesn't know, keeps making more and more errors and the teacher keeps shocking him more and more and more on this big shock box until there's a point at which he stops responding, he's probably unconscious, and instead of quitting, the experiment says you must continue to the very end, which is 450 volts. Two-thirds of all ordinary Americans went to the end, two-thirds. But in, in the many experiments he did, he did two that are, have been ignored. In one, you come in ready to help, to be a teacher, and when you sit down, you observe somebody from the previous experiment going all the way. In another study, you come in and you observe two people refusing. So they are two social models of evil and good. And you know what happens? If the base rate is 60% who blindly obey, when you see somebody go all the way, it becomes a negative model for you, and 91% of all the population in those studies go all the way. But if you see people rebel, 90% refuse to go on. And so this is something we have to deal with. Why is it that it's so important 
for most societies for people to blindly obey authority. To blindly obey authority means be mindless, don't be mindful, don't do critical thinking, just do what you're told. And that then links up. If parents say, mind your own business, don't get involved, you know, don't think too deeply about it, just do what I say. That is one of the worst things that could happen in any society. An unthinking society is a society that's vulnerable to the psychopaths because they say, I have the answer, I have the way, I have the money, I have the power, I have the status, I can give you jobs. All you have to do is do it my way. And those totalitarian dictators had the same message. Give me your power and I will give you security or the illusion of security. And all you have to do is do what I tell you to do. Many people are willing to give up freedom because it has associated responsibility for the illusion of security. For somebody to say, okay, you're a good boy, you're a good child, now, now go play in the corner and don't bother the grown-ups. But nobody teaches us to make the distinction between just authority that deserves our respect and unjust authority that deserves defiance. Well, I think the first thing I'd say to people is, is pay attention to your gut. Uh, I think a lot of people ignore the gut feeling, the instinct. And you've got instinct, and you should pay attention to it. I think, you know, human beings uh, are the, maybe the only um, animal species that will uh, ignore that, that gut instinct. But the organizations themselves and the systems are sociopathic. You can't expect them to have a conscience. You can't expect them to have a heart. You have to live within their nature. Care. If a building can't have social responsibility, what does it mean to say that a corporation can? A corporation is simply a artificial legal structure. It doesn't have any, it's neither moral nor immoral. It's simply what it is. But the people who are engaged in it, whether the stockholders, whether the executives in it, whether the employees, they all have moral responsibilities. I mean, I, every one of us under some circumstances could be, uh, you know, a, a gas chamber attendant and a saint. And, you know, you see a starving child and you can steal food from him and there's no policeman around. Uh, very few people would do it. If they would do it, they're really pathological. I mean, there's some pathological extremes, but ordinarily people wouldn't behave like that. They do behave like that on a massive scale, massive scale, uh, but they're unaware of it. And uh, there's a huge indoctrination system designed to make them unaware of it, and even to make them think that the starving child is stealing from them, you know, so we're the victims. Uh, uh, that's what propaganda and regimentation are all about, and you know, it sort of works, and it uh, erodes the moral character. Uh, uh, it, it prevents you from looking at what you yourself are doing or what your leaders are doing and worry about somebody else. So you see that all, all the time. So the people can be very moral, but they're, they're acting within institutional structures, uh, constructed systems in which only certain options are easy to pursue. Others are very hard to pursue. If you have a business executive who really wants to take on social responsibilities, get rid of him fast. He doesn't have the right sense of priorities and will do a poor job running. The psychopaths' uh, relations with others are superficial, uh, surface, uh, very, very little depth. Uh, mostly style over substance and the idea is to impress other individuals to somehow put them in a position where you can manipulate them and so forth. And a corporation I imagine would be not unlike that in many respects. They would have public relations firms, they would be spending half their uh, time and a lot of their budget on trying to present a particular image to other people. And this image is a very superficial and you never really get to know the real corporation. You're going to see what they want you to see. Uh, a psychopath is also uh, a grandiose individual, has a, uh, a very powerful sense of self, uh, believes that uh, he or she is the center of the universe, better 
uh, smarter than everybody else. Uh, corporations, I suppose, almost by their very nature, would have to adopt this particular attitude. If they uh, took the stance that they were, in fact, inferior to every other company, uh, they're probably not going to get very far. So I imagine that they would spend an awful lot of time uh, explaining to others and to themselves that uh, we're number one, we're the best. Uh, Psychopath is also very manipulative, tends to manipulate, con, and deceive other people to try and mold them into something that they can use. Remember, the psychopath is really a predator, and uh, uh, as a predator, you're trying to groom and put your prey in the right position for you, where you can make some use of the, uh, uh, this particular object, is the way they would see them. Would a corporation be the same? Uh, to a very large extent, I would imagine so, uh, because what you're trying to do is manipulate everything, including public opinion, for one thing. And uh, imagine in a sales meeting where you're trying to get everybody pumped up, you've got to have to, you know, raw, raw, you've got to manipulate them, get them into a position where they actually believe in something that they may not have believed in before. Uh, psychopath lacks empathy. And this simply means that it's very difficult or impossible for a psychopath to put himself inside the, the emotional skin of somebody else. Uh, they may understand at some sort of super, superficial level that this person is going through what could be uh, construed as an emotion by other people, but I don't understand what it is. This is a psychopath's uh, position. Uh, would a company or a corporation actually lack empathy? Well, maybe by definition they would have to. Uh, if you're concerned about uh, the fate of your competitors, uh, and also the general public, uh, you may not have uh, um, profits that are so respectable. And so uh, I suppose this corporation could lack empathy in, uh, in the sense that the psychopath does. Lacks remorse is another characteristic that defines psychopathy. That is, having done something, you don't feel badly about it. Corporation, I imagine, would be much the same, uh, unless one is caught. Now, a psychopath who is caught for committing a crime, the first thing he'll say is, yeah, I'm really sorry I did it, I, I feel remorse, but only when caught. And I imagine that most corporations would be much the same. Uh, if, you know, if, if some sort of regulatory body finds out what you're doing and if it's considered to be illegal, I would imagine that uh, they would say, well, yes, I, I really, we're really sorry, but otherwise they're not likely to do that. Psychopath doesn't accept responsibility for uh, his or her own behavior. Uh, usually, uh, diffusion of responsibility is the name of the game for the psychopath. Somebody else may be due. It wasn't my fault. It was fate. Uh, and uh, I'm not really responsible. Corporations would do this almost routinely, I would imagine. Uh, in fact, they would have public relations personnel whose only job is to make sure that the that this, this image is portrayed to the general public as, yes, uh, uh, somebody else, it was fate, it was a political decision, or it was not, the market certainly crashed, and there was a war in some other place, and this accounted for everything. Uh, psychopaths tend to be uh, impulsive, but in a fairly controlled sense. That is, uh, most psychopaths are not going to do things if there's an external control present. The, the psychopath standing on the street corner is not going to commit a crime with the policeman standing right next to him. On the other hand, if the policeman is not there, if the external control is not there, uh, then it's possible that he or she will do whatever he feels like doing if he has a chance of getting away with it. Are corporations impulsive? Uh, it's, it's difficult to actually evaluate this, but I would imagine so uh, uh, in, in some, some cases, particularly if the corporation is not well structured, if the rules and the, uh, of, of behavior and the hierarchical structure is not firmly in place, then it would be very possible for a, a corporation to, be, to act impulsively. Uh, of course, if you do this, then, uh, then you run the risk of actually you know, experiencing fairly serious losses. Uh, psychopaths don't uh, have long-term goals. Uh, most of their, uh, their, the things that they're striving for are short-term and could refer to as a short-term form of hedonism. Uh, and corporations, I imagine, are much the same way. In fact, uh, one could argue that sacrificing short-term profits for the long-term potential of making profits would not be in the company's best interest. So almost by their very nature, they would have to uh, lack long-term goals. Now, some corporations, of course, would have a long-term strategy, but at the same time, they'd have these short-term goals that are firmly in place. They've got to go to the next stockholders meeting, for example, and show that there's a profit. Poor behavioral controls is another characteristic that defines a psychopath. These are individuals 
we're likely to lose their temper very easily to strike out and do things that are fairly irrational in the short term, but they do it in a very controlled manner. And they know what they're doing. Uh, it could be a rea reaction to frustration and so forth. Uh, corporations, uh, th this is very difficult for me to evaluate this, to translate directly into the corporate field. I suppose it could be paused, but I'd have to think about that for some, uh, you know, another four or five years, I think. Uh, psychopaths tend to be irresponsible. And that means that, that their behavior uh, doesn't take into account what's likely to happen to somebody else. They will put others at risk. Their own behavior puts other people at risk all the time. This could be in driving, it could be in their, their personal relations or, or anything they, they do in their, their general life. And corporations, I imagine, uh, could be uh, irresponsible in exactly the same way. That is, in an attempt to satisfy the corporate goal, everybody else is put at risk. This could be other companies. As a matter of fact, I suppose one could argue that this is good in the business sense. I mean, if your competitors fall by the wayside because you are acting irresponsibly with respect to them, that's good, as long as, it's, as you get some sort of goal out of that, some sort of benefit. Psychopaths also tend to engage in behavior that is antisocial or at least asocial from a very early age, and this continues on throughout uh, most of the lifespan. And by this I mean their behavior is not necessarily criminal in the strict sense of the term, but in fact it's harmful to other people, other individuals. May not take into account the fact that your behavior is going to have negative consequences for somebody else. Corporation could be much the same, uh, and this ties in with irresponsibility to a certain extent, that uh, what they're doing uh, with respect to the general public and to other companies would clearly be looked at, viewed as, or construed as asocial or antisocial. We just don't really care. If a building what does have a valence is the human heart and what it can express itself around through, through widening the circle of empathy. Why should I care more about empathy than the next guy? None of the rich guys made it big through empathy. Why should I give up my comfort and my aspirations? We all want to win, don't we? You have somebody at the very top of the organization, and you know I work with a, a number of these people, and they're all making um, what I think most any of us would consider just extreme amounts of money. And if you think about the effect of this on psychologically on the people, it becomes a situation where money and the desire for money simply begets more desire. And I think that's a very, and I think that's a very primitive, uh, from what we understand about human psychology, that's a very primitive state of desire and appetite to see it as, as limitless and to be able to almost devour anything. Uh, and usually in our own process of maturation, we have the experience of encountering limits, right? And I think there is something certainly that goes on psychologically where those limits become removed. There are some things we can do to make them better. And one of them is to give up on the, the pursuit of happiness in the sense that happiness is something you get from a meal. told that one way or another, we're all part of the fish head. <sighs> well, even if we accept that, I mean, what is there to do? It's so big, there's nothing we can do. And if we're all going down, we might as well take a few pleasures along the way. Is there hope? Maybe. And maybe the hope is the same as the reason that we're in this mess together. Because we are in it together. Or what I think is somewhat novel about the work that we've done is not that we've shown that people are affected by those around them. This is common sense, right? We know this. We know that human beings are affected by others. But what we've been able to show, I think, is that we're affected not just by people who are one degree removed from us, but also by people who are two and even three Others. degrees removed. And you get this incredibly baroque, intricate, beautiful pattern of human social networks. And most people, when they hear social networks nowadays, they think about the online variety, which is a very recent These phenomenon. You know, but in reality, human beings have been assembling themselves into social networks for hundreds of thousands of years. What our generosity study shows is that if the good things that we do tend to ripple out so that the people around us copy those good things and the people around them copy those good things. It's also possible that some of those paths loop back to us. If you're exposed to people who treat you kindly and cooperate with you, 
Then, when the bell rings and you interact with new people who are strangers to you, you treat them kindly. And then when the bell rings and those people interact with still other new people, they treat those people kindly. Strangers. So, so I absolutely believe that when you learn that you influence not just your friends, but your friends' friends and your friends' friends' friends, that it changes the way you see the world. When we looked at how happiness spread from person to person to person, and when we saw that it spread three degrees of separation, I started making a concerted effort to change my mood when I walked yeah. down the street. And I would put on my favorite song, even if I was in kind of a bad mood, to try and just give myself a temporary boost so that when I walked in the door that I could make myself happier and therefore make my family happier and everyone in their lives happier. This is all very is nice, but uh, I mean, how do we know that doing something for others is worth the effort? Unless we're sure that it's going to pay off, we're probably not going to do it. Around. Everybody has the power to do so. It starts on me and passes it on to others. The reason why morality pays off is because we have an influence on the decisions of people around us. When they copy our moral behavior, then this is going to spread through the network and it also will have this tendency to ripple out and bounce back the towards us. That this is the way that we succeed, that we survive, that we reproduce these ideas and we create a better future for ourselves.